yeah, that's the key you see, Jason. I think it's very important what you're saying there. It's it's the the, the fact that you are oblivion. We are oblivion. You know, it's we use often this image when we, in the intercultural world. You know, it's a the fish. You you're a fish in your in your fishbowl. You know, it's when you're taken out of your fishbowl that you're aware of the temperature that you had water around you. Same with with our culture. You know, it's by the fact that you're thrown into something different. That's Edith Caron. Edith is a senior executive coach, a coach supervisor, a facilitator, a published author, public speaker, and a former international correspondent who has written for Newsday, Le Monde, Radio France, The Sunday Times, and The Christian Science Monitor. For more than 30 years, Edith has had a remarkable global career spanning four continents, and stretching from her early years as a war correspondent in Central America to becoming the first qualified coach supervisor in China. Edith works at the crossroads of business, people, and organizational development, where global leadership and teams are becoming an increasingly important part of our work. Edith helps bring together the rich kaleidoscopes of individuals and groups to not only operate in this world of increased complexity, but to also thrive and leverage their diversity. Edith's first book, The Last Exodus, explored the wave of Soviet Jewish immigration to Israel, which was a part of the Aliyah, which means the ascent in Hebrew, and is used to describe the immigration of Jews from the diaspora. That opened up in the early 1990s after the government of Mikhail Gorbachev opened the borders of the Soviet Union to Jewish immigration. Living in Beijing for 10 years, Edith observed China's encounter or interaction and connection with the world, she wrote another book. It was called China Blend, The Cultural Hybrids Bridging the World. It explored the cultural hybridity that globalism encourages, especially in the fields of business and education. Back in France, she created and helped the International Coaching Federation France Committee get off the ground and also explore artificial intelligence, digital, and coaching and their integration together. Edith regularly lectures on this topic. She contributed a chapter to AI and the digital technology and coaching in the Coach's Handbook. It's a complete practitioner's guide that was published in 2021. Today, we're going to talk about the impact of culture on how we work and operate as a society, the growth of globally geographically dispersed teams, and artificial intelligence. Edith, I just wanted to thank you for joining me. We've known each other for several years, and I always feel like every time I encounter you, I'm learning new things about the world. So I really appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure talking to you always. Great, great. I um, I wanted to go ahead and start off the conversation talking a little bit about your career and sort of how you got to where you are today. You know, I, I, I was really interested in how you grew up and what ultimately led you to uh, sort of explore the idea of becoming a journalist and then eventually a war correspondent. Yeah, well, I, I come, you know, the war correspondent, bit maybe that's where we start because I, I have been living with people in uniform all my youth and childhood uh, because my father was uh, in kind of the National Guard. French gendarmerie, and I come from a military fa- a family from my on my father's side. So all this uniform business was something very familiar, let's put it like that. And on my mother's side, it was a very uh, deeply rooted family in the wine region, in the, the Burgundy, in one of the wine regions of France. Very conservative, uh, deeply Catholic, uh, with very specific ideas of the roles of women, and uh, that is an important part in the sense that I obviously rebelled against that at a later stage. But I was a, I was a curious child, avid reader, no television until 1968 in my family. 
And um, so I read books and discovered the world through books, first of all. And I had good teachers who encouraged me. So I was very lucky. Uh, all that was happening as well when I was becoming uh, a teenager in the backdrop of the post-68 uh, years where, you know, everything was possible, lots of new ideas floating, very rebellious times as well. Uh, so I fitted into this very naturally and went on to study literature with a specialty in theatre and um, worked as a look at a local paper. And that's how I discovered journalism, which was fantastic because what I really, really, I had a fantastic uh, discovery there that I was allowed to talk to basically anybody and that people would talk to me and I could tell the stories, which was amazing. So that's the first. And then I went on, you know, to, to study journalism in the U.S. I started my first reporting trips in North Africa before going to the U.S. Then and I went out as a, as, a, as a freelancer in West Africa and then went off to Central America as a war correspondent. So my father is a uh, veteran of the Vietnam War. And mm. when I was graduating high school, I had two interesting uh, ideas about potential careers because I had worked at the student newspaper at our at our mm -hmm. high school, and you know this will probably surprise a lot of people who know me today. But I I really considered the idea of either being a journalist or actually mm -hmm. becoming a minister. I was always interested mm -hmm. in theology and becoming a minister mm -hmm. and becoming a chap chaplain in the military. My father encouraged mm -hmm. me to do anything I wanted to do. But this was the one time where he intervened and it took me on a car ride. And the whole car ride was very clearly about, do you really want to go in the military? They were, they were much more supportive of the idea of being a journalist and not so supportive of the idea of going in the military. And I ultimately you know, became a journalist. But I was just thinking and listening to that idea of growing up in Burgundy in a very conservative culture. Mm -hmm. How did your family feel about the idea of you going into journalism, particularly going overseas? Well, they were relieved that I didn't go into theater. <laughs> so that came, as a, <laughs> that came as a relief, to be honest. And by then, they had understood that I, was my, I had quite strong will. Uh, I got myself a scholarship to study in the U.S., uh, so that was my own making. And uh, and I suppose, and I had long conversations with my dad, actually, at some point. By by the time I was a war correspondent, we, w we had very different conversations about what his wars had been, because he had been in Indochina, he had been in Morocco, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, prior to Vietnam when the French were right. fighting this, uh, the war in Indochina. So all of a sudden, we were able to have proper discussion of, what it was like. And I understood what it was like for a man who was 20 to be, you know, leading a team of 200 people in, in the middle of the war. So it, it was, uh, uh, it was my, probably my, um, my ambition, you know, to be a young woman behaving a bit like a boy, you know, doing, proving to them all these things subconsciously. But it also, uh, allowed us to have much more adult conversations. So it, it was, about it was sort of like a rebellion and something that brought you guys closer in a way because of that. Yeah. yeah. I am, um, one of the things, you know, that strikes me about um, foreign cultures, right before I left journalism, I threw my hat in to be an East African uh, correspondent. Mm -hmm. and when, yeah. And when I sat down with Hal Raines, who was then the editor of the newspaper, he asked me, why did you want to, why do you want to do it? And I said, you know, one of the beauties of being a journalism journalist is that you get this opportunity to be the connoisseur of everything in the world. You know, I can drive down the road, and I remember one time seeing a Christmas tree on the roof of a building, and it actually became a story for me. And I had a friend who was like, "You're so I'm so jealous of that opportunity." And what I told Hal was, I one of the things about moving to New York after you know, growing up in Virginia and Texas and Maryland in very homogenous communities, uh, New York really opened my eyes up to the idea that there were different ways of doing things, different ways of approaching the world. And some of the people that I was closest with were a group of people from Poland. And one of the things that I learned about the Eastern European mentality, that it was so very different than, um, mine, you know, more, more skeptical, but more open to certain things. And I said, this, this is an awesome opportunity for me to 
both learn and grow, but also translate back to other people important issues because America and the West have such a strong influence on what happens in cultures that are very different than yours. What inspired you to do it? Well, it started, I suppose, at a personal level because I had foreign friends at university. Uh, I had some love stories with the men who were from, you know, from different cultures. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly very important. And that was my, you know, also... You, my my little uh, feminist uh, trait as well, seeing why you know boys do it, why couldn't I do it? And the fact that it would be too dangerous for women for a woman, it was part of this generation of you know I meant to say that as well of women where we were the first generation really to kind of really s assert our legitimacy in the field of uh, war correspondence uh, in in the world of war correspondence. There were a few early on, you know, in uh, during World War II and things like this, and Vietnam a little bit, but not as many as when I was working in Central America. And then it continued, you know, with Bosnia, etc. But to go back to your question about going abroad, well, having studied in the U.S., same, I found that Columbia, Missouri, there was a fantastically international crowd of uh, foreign students at the journalism school, American students, but also lots of people from all over the world, extremely bright, extremely interesting. Uh, so that was um, the faculty was not diverse in this matter, this matter, but the 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 students were extremely diverse. So that that was also helpful in terms of uh, getting gaining some familiarity with you know working in uh, and operating in this very different uh, uh, diverse community. And then it was just the reality of work when you are a young aspiring journalist, where you have to go where there is work. Mm. And when there is work, it tends to be nasty parts of the world. Mm. Yes. Right? Uh, so being very pragmatic, you know, I'm not pretending to be idealistic on this one. I just went where, you know, West Africa, because it was really my, my first interest. But I realized that as a young freelancer, I just couldn't make a living in West Africa. It was too hard. Nobody cared about not Africa enough. at the time. Not much more today, but at the time, nobody cared. And uh, and Central America was an obvious place where to be because there were there were lots of stories and uh, there was an appetite because it was you know the last battlefield of the Cold War etc. So all and Washington was very much setting up the agenda uh, with all the votes you know in Congress for for the Contras the counter revolutionary movement was trying to topple the Sandinista government so it was it was very much front page material. And and that's what I did. And I went and then I was, you know, eventually worked for Liberation, Radio France, et, et cetera. And, um, and that's what so I, I was born in the um, early 1970s. And, you know, in the 90s, I, you know, that's when my journalism career um, began. But when I was at the University of Maryland, one of my mentors and professors was Nan Robertson. And she was a Washington correspondent for the, uh, for the New York Times in the 1970s. And I remember having this conversation with her that just shocked me because I thought the 1970s the United States was much more progressive. She wrote this book called uh, Girls in the Balcony, and it referred mm -hmm. to where women sat in the National Press Club. They had to sit up in the balcony, if you can imagine that, in the 1970s. And I was really surprised by how the liberal New York Times – even, you know, at the, the the women there had to, you know, file a sex discrimination lawsuit against them over, you know, mm -hmm. hiring policy and uh, pay. And it just struck me that even, even very late, even after the 60s revolution, for some reason, people felt that women shouldn't be in the newsroom and certainly not in in a foreign correspondence role. Were there many women out there when you were in Central America? Well, absolutely. We, we were, as I was saying, I think we were this first wave. I mean, s significantly a lot of women. I remember there was Lydia Chavez for the New York Times, Marjorie Miller, uh, I forgot for whom she worked. But, you know, there were quite a few and, and photographers. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the Americans, uh, but, you know, equally for Europeans, one of my colleagues, Italian woman, I, I, we were quite a few. And that was remarkable because we had really broken uh this kind of i don't know if it's unspoken but uh yeah maybe unspoken rule that 
men were war correspondents and women were not. So no, no, it was really the first generation, and then it continued, and um, and which is fine. Uh, and now you have you know women foreign uh, foreign editors. I mean, it was unthinkable. <laughs> there is a club of actually oh, women wow. foreign editor now. I, I gather uh, in in North America. Uh, several of my friends are foreign editors, and uh, I know for a fact that it took them, you know, many, many decades to get there. I think about that time, and you mentioned the end of the Cold War, and I think it's mm. hard for people to relate to what that time was like, and even the Western involvement in places like Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela and, you know, mm. El Salvador and in places like that, what was it? What was it like to cover the? Because really, I think the Cold War truly ended, and you know, we we think of the Berlin Wall, but I actually think the battle actually ended in some Central uh, Central America. Yeah. yeah, the battle. Well, let's say that you know, it was clear that who had won uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, but we were we were very uh, we were very clear on that that it was this last battleground. Well, if you remember the chronology, you had the invasion of Grenada in two thousand uh, in uh, nineteen ninety eighty two, I believe. Then you know the Sandinista had come to power in seventy nine. Then uh, uh, the uh, Reagan administration uh, was very uh, worried, uh, very concerned. Because you had several guerrilla movements in Central America, you had the one in El Salvador, you had the one in Guatemala. The Sandinista had come to power in uh, in uh, in. And Nicaragua. of course, we thought if one the... country fell, then every country yeah, would exactly. fall in the world. That was the famous domino theory, you know. Uh, not really looking looking at it in a purely ideological through a purely ideological perspective, when they were you know, hard facts in terms of land ownership, et cetera, redistribution of wealth, access to education, et cetera. You know, the, the, the usual, both corruption and concentration of power and poverty, uh, really. But, you know, all this, it was all this backdrop in which, yes, you know, guerrilla movements find a fertile, fertile ground. And it was also, yes, financed by, you know, supported by Cuba, financed by weapons from the Soviet Union, on and on. So, how was it? It was fascinating because we had, as reporters covering Central America, part of our job as well was to go to Washington to get a sense of what was mm-hmm. going on, was to spend time in Miami with, uh, because the Contra, for example, they were based, you know, the, the rear guard was in Miami and they were supported by uh, Cuban uh, exiles, etc. So you had all this mosaic of this uh, both history and geography of Central America so it was really, really interesting because we, and also what was really interesting as a, as a reporter, which is very exceptional, because of the very nature of the war, because these countries are small after all, and because it all, was all intertwined, you could cover both sides of the story. So let's say you could go on, in operation with the a, with a, with a, with a Salvadoran military and uh, the week after go on in operation with the guerrilla mm-hmm. movement and same thing in Nicaragua, right? So it was really fascinating to be able to cover and both you, sides. you could really get the perspective of both sides, which is something in war correspondence that doesn't usually happen now. You get embedded yeah. with one side yeah. and you stay with, exactly. yeah. I, one of the things that I, I just sort of think about during that time and that piece of the Cold War you know, I think about all these wild things. You know, the U.S. invaded Cuba. We mined mm-hmm. the Nicaraguan uh, harbors. Mm-hmm. You know, wild things to win these wars. Mm-hmm. Do you think the Soviets and the Americans had broad misconceptions about the cultures there? I don't. I don't know if it's culture. I think it's it's different. It's ideology and it's uh, it's hegemony, uh, which is slightly different. There is also a gross misunderstanding. You know, it becomes very simplistic. For me, I, I lived in Russia, for example. For I give you a very simple example. I lived in Russia for for four years between ninety four and ninety eight, and uh, it took me living in Russia, having been educated in the French school system, having been educated partly in an American university, uh, to understand the toll Russia had paid during World War II. And that actually, because in France, we learned, you know, thanks to America, the world was saved, right? Uh, Well, it took me living in Russia to understand that if the Russians hadn't 
had so many deaths, hadn't sacrificed so many people, with the brutality of Stalin, of course, we would perhaps not have won this war. I mean, who knows? But, you know, but that's learning history from the Russian perspective. I also found it extremely interesting. And this is what, what, for me, that's the bottom line, you know, and of the work from an intellectual perspective, from the culture with a big C, if you wish, uh, what we can learn, you know, in terms of uh, of history, of literature, of what constitutes culture with a big C. I think we would be wiser if we could look at things from, learn from different perspectives, right? And I'm, I belong to it. My family is franco British, mm. <laughs> So I know it from, both right, from both. you know, what my kids yeah. have learned. Uh, in the English curriculum or the French curriculum, whether Napoleon is a hero or a villain, <laughs> it's very clearly uh, defined on which education system. Yeah, exactly. I um I remember reading the book by Masha Gessen, the Man Without mm-hmm. a Face. I think I believe it was called. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that struck me was, you know, to your point about the Great Patriotic War, as the Soviets yeah. call it. I think there are often times, and I, I, I just think the Russians are a great example of this, where, and, and you see it in companies as well, but we make missteps in terms of how we imagine other people's cultures, right? We imagine that yeah. they're going to have the same motives as us and the same values and intentions and yeah. same history. So, you know, for example, you know, I was one of those people who probably since 2015 have said, Vladimir Putin is going to invade Ukraine. <laughs> and I remember so many people, so many smart people saying to me, well, you know, like, it's not really in their interest. It's going to be very difficult for them to actually do it. And I said, you're not looking at the history of Russia from the hundreds and hundreds of years beyond exactly. and what it was like when they were Muscovy and they were being invaded by the Ottomans and the you know, other forces that they have a very, very um, different mentality. And I think that can be one of the things that really gets in the way in terms of us understanding other people's um, culture. But you see, yeah, exactly. And it's it's true that it has been my privilege because I have lived and worked uh, in Africa, West Africa. I've lived and worked in Central America, South in Argentina, based in Argentina, then based in Jerusalem, Middle East, then Russia, then back to Europe, and then China, which means that your your center of gravity changes. You see things, you see the world uh, de facto through another perspective. perspective. Uh, you, you have to kind of remove your own cultural glasses, if you want, your filters, your presuppositions, and if you want to understand, particularly as a journalist, you better dive into this new, you know, this country you're supposed to report from uh, and try really to, 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 get, to get under the skin of it. Um, that you're never going to be a native, of course, and that's not your role as a foreign correspondent, but it is really important. And even in the job I do now, and I think it applies the same way, is getting a, gaining an understanding of the culture of the companies I work with, you know. Uh, getting an understanding of the team's culture, uh, of the, all this contextual information is really important. And having been a journalist, it's something I still use. You know, I'm, I'm very curious about all this. And I think it informs also the work I do, we do, you and yeah. I, you know, uh, very, very strongly. Do you strongly. think that the only way to do that is to, you know, and we've done work together in Africa and other yeah. places, yeah. But do you do you think the only way to do that is to immerse yourself into a culture, or are there other things that people can do to sort of broaden their aperture? Well, uh, obviously, living living in a, in another country that's that's going to be the number one accelerator. It's an immersion, right? It's there is no way you have to even things smell differently, right? Even the the touch. Uh, of I don't know the water doesn't mm-hmm. feel the same, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that matters, right? And it talks to your senses. Uh, the food we know the food is not the same, etc. So that's one thing. And the language, you know, you have to learn the languages uh, because this is the tool of communication, and languages tell us a lot. So that's another aspect. If you cannot do that, well. 
of course, you can understand by reading tons of stuff. Uh, but I think it's, you know, being in interactions and asking questions and talking and uh, and challenging your own preconceptions, you know, your own uh, views. Yeah, I think... I think this is... The yeah, and I think the thing that struck me, you know, being in New York and exposed to different cultures, there were so many things that I had assumed were just like, um, mm. you know, everybody believed this or this is just the way it was. And it was neat to be exposed to that. I'm curious uh, how you made the transition um, from mm -hmm. being a journalist to sort of exploring coaching and leadership and organizational development and whether there was a, I, I think you've kind of alluded to it, but whether there was a connection between those different right. pieces of work. Yeah, I suppose I didn't realize at the time I was doing it, but when I wrote my first book on the Soviet Jewish immigration to Israel, I really started looking into what made these people Soviet in the first place and how they transformed into Israelis. Mm -hmm. So that was perhaps the first, but I was not conscious of it. I was telling a story. I was looking at it, you know, it was happening. I was telling the story of this massive aliyah and the political consequences, but looking at it from people's perspective, it was really their individual story, how it was echoing and reflecting the history with a big age. The way it literally happened, I came back to France after 20 years abroad, and I came back as a foreign correspondent uh, for a newspaper at the time called The European, um, based in London. And that was good because I was both, um, I was local because I spoke the language and I, I, I had my references in France, but I was very much, you know, outside of it because I hadn't lived there for 20 years. So that was good. I had this distance, right? which was an interesting exercise. And eventually, I started uh, getting a sense of this intercultural world. And I was feeling a little bit awkward being both inside and outside, but I didn't know that that was my, the way I felt. Uh, I didn't realize I was suffering from what we call uh, reverse culture shock. We know about culture shock when you go into another culture. I was suffering the reverse culture shock, coming back into mm -hmm. my own, but not, you know, having missed this 20 years. So, and I went to see a therapist and the therapist gave me this book called Outsider by uh, Howard Becker, who was a sociologist and he had studied the marginals, drug addicts and jazz musicians in Chicago in the 60s. When this guy gave me, the, the therapist gave me this book, I thought, what is this? I mean, why? I mean, this guy is mad. And I read the book, and of course, it clicked. I thought, of course. He's telling me that I, I feel like an outsider, uh, and I look at the other people as insiders, and I'm kind of navigating this delicate re-entry point. That was as simple as yeah, that. Yeah, right? kind of, a, you know, in thinking about your book on – you know, the Jewish immigration and what you're really describing that you went through in terms of like almost having to reassimilate. Yeah. You know, Eli Weasel, the Holocaust survivor, the author, mm -hmm. wrote, you know, a series of books, the Night Trilogy. And I was always struck by the, and, and, and really tie this back to your experience and also think about what it must have been like to go from being a Soviet citizen to a in a very controlled country to an Israeli citizen where there's much more freedom. But I, I think of the last book in that trilogy, and it's about um, a Holocaust survivor who came to New York. And one of the striking things to me about the book, you know, even beyond the actual plot line, was how difficult it was to acclimate uh, to a new and different culture. And I kind of think about you know, leaders are not going through an intense experience like that. But you could be in New York leading a team in China and Singapore yeah. and other places. And I just imagine that it's immensely difficult to sort of switch your lens. Yeah, no, it is very difficult. And, uh, and to be honest, for a long time, you had on top of it the, the power of uh, the magnet power of headquarters and the dominant culture of any organization tends to be where the headquarters are right. based, right? It might be slightly different nowadays because some of the teams are and companies are much more uh, spread around the world in terms of their even the way they're built. I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, some IT company I've been working for. You know, yes, they are 
things in Silicon Valley, but they also have very strong uh, operations in India, for example, or very strong operations in Europe. You know, let's see. Let's let's. But generally speaking, so it is difficult. You also have the uh, I would think aggravating factor is that. For a long, long time, and I think it still prevails, the leaderships of these organizations was reflecting the dominant culture of the organization, <clears throat> right? In terms of color, in terms of uh, gender, in terms of etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, where very seldom do you have, in some cases, you do, but people coming from, you know, the other side of the earth and being the leader of an organization. Very seldom. I mean, it was very clear, for example, and I asked that when I wrote my second book on China, on these cultural hybrids, and I asked very specifically to some of my clients, I said, when is it we're going to have a Chinese CEO of your company? In China, in China. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the, the, the CEO of the time, who's a very, very bright man, who's now on the board of his global company, told me, oh, not for another 10 to 20 oh, years. Oh, wow. He was very honest. He so was a very, very honest. interesting right. thing, but, you know, I do some work with um, global uh, car companies and, mm -hmm. you know, several of them, you know, German companies in the United States mm -hmm. have factories, they have regional mm -hmm. offices. And, you know, for one of those companies, one of the projects that I was working on was uh, the idea of helping the leaders who were coming over from Germany, because the head of whatever group it was, was always German, sort of um, mm -hmm. get comfortable and acclimated to the American culture so they should leave there. And I remember having this one conversation, you know, consulting with the, the, the people overseas saying, well, why does a German have to run that? And it just caught them absolutely flat-footed. <laughs> there was no good answer. Yeah, no, it, it's it's complex, you know, because uh, there is a, a trust factor. There is uh, always the fact that you tend to promote people who look like you. We know that it's a it's a it's a recurring flaw in organization. That's why women haven't been promoted as much as they should have been, right? Uh, it's the, always the minority yeah. factor, you know. But to it, it is interesting because on the one hand. Globalization has been defined and developed as an economic model, right? It was for cost uh, reasons, for production cost reasons, for markets, being closer to markets. I mean, there are lots of reasons, right, to analyze what our contemporary globalization is. But it is an, an, an economic model that we defined. What was very interesting is that it looks, I mean, from my experience, having worked in this now for, you know, many, many years, it looked to me that the human dimension of it came as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, well, yes, oh, gosh, oh, my gosh, we have to do something so that these people get, to, you know, get along better or that they, there is less misunderstanding in their communication. Or, you know, I always remember this, but it is very strong. It's, it's not in terms of uh, systematically national cultures mm -hmm. that it plays. I remember working for a big oil company and they, they, they had merged at some point. And years later, more than 10 years after the merger, uh, they were still able to identify which original company they were from. Oh, wow. Right? Right. And they were both from the same the country. The way they solved right? problems so it's, it's, or the way they just by... Yeah, yeah. And they were kind of, and it was something, it was, it still mattered to them. So it's again, going back to this insiders, outsiders, you know, where do we draw our circles of belonging? Whom do we include? Whom do we exclude? We aware of this for diversity. I think it's the same when we bringing it, you know, to um, various branches in a company, various functions, we see, you know, IT always gets the heat. It's always blamed for everything uh, by, by the others uh, or the supply chain, you know, is always blamed and et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure it's always IT's fault from my perspective. Yeah, it's always <laughs> IT's fault, right. <laughs> but, but really interestingly, it is, I mean, in, in countries like the US where it's already, you, you're operating in a country which, which is the size of a continent, right? You have all the, the time zones different. So there is 
some level of familiarity of, uh, you know, California could be a state, in a, a nation in its own right, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's so big. Um, <laughs> in terms of economy, in terms of population, in terms of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but in other, we, we perhaps understand it better when it has to do with the U.S. because also you speak the same right. way. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the mindset, you know, you think of something like Germans and maybe a little bit more of an engineering focus or that some African countries have a more hierarchical approach or in other countries you start with like, a trust deficit, as you've said before, and, you know, and, and other people. But do you think that we oversimplify it a little bit by just focusing on nationality as well? Absolutely. I think we have to be very careful because we reinforce stereotypes there. You know, so it's, it's, it's a delicate act because there is some validity on the fact that because of history, uh, because, you know, the organizations of company are going to be because of, History, because of the, the 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 how can I put it the, the religious dimension maybe the substrat you know, things in the society that have built the society bring people together gives them some sense of commonality yeah. that is worth deciphering understanding where it comes mm. from right uh, you know I speak about the French because it's easier for me I'm, I carry a French passport I was educated in this country so the fact that we have this reputation of being all French are philosophers. Well, okay, maybe. <laughs> yes, actually, philosophers play an, ama an amazing role in this country. Amazing role. They're invited on television shows, etc. Like in no other parts of the world. I remember when I was still a journalist, I wrote a, a, an article about this. You had cafe philo bars where people would go on Sunday morning and discuss philosophy. <laughs> on and on, you know. Is it true for everybody? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. You know. uh, so it's it's it's. But there is some validity in the fact that yes, you know, the Enlightenment was very important. There were lots of philosophers, and we still. But it can use broad. Um, I guess mm. what, while there's it becomes a heuristic, right, to, to understand yeah. things. But if you're if you're applying that heuristic in, incorrectly, it could probably lead to some. Broad yeah, exactly. I, you know, I think about uh, the war in Ukraine and, you know, I, I remember a lot yeah. of people saying Ukrainians feel this way or Ukrainians feel that way. And that, I, I remember saying in this one conversation, well, are you talking about the Russian speakers in the Donbass? Are you talking about the Russian mm -hmm. speakers in Crimea who have a deep link yeah. to the Ottoman Empire? Or are you talking about the people in the central part of the country, like Dina Pro and yeah. Kiev, who have like connection to the Cossacks or the people in Western Ukraine who have deep Romanian and Polish, you know, the Polish Lithuanians took over and said, you know, you got to be careful. And I think it's true. Exactly. Exactly. And what I think is, you know, when uh, we are all complex, we all have our own complexity. So what I would say to leaders particularly, you know, is uh, one of the, values would be to embrace their own complexity, encourage it in their people. Sort of apply uh, it to themselves even, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and not, never assume, you know, be curious, be humble, ask questions, and, uh, and, and not assume. What, what kills us most of the time is assumption. We assume. Right. You know, we have, uh, we, we're very aware of uh, unconscious biases, right, in, um, in uh, diversity issues. Same, yeah. same, same. I, I, one of the yeah. things I was thinking about before the pandemic, um, you know, mm. the concept of sort of like geographically dispersed teams, social distancing, remote work, you know, became super common terms, became a part of all of our lives. And, you know, mm. sort of globalization for many people had already introduced those concepts to the workplace and the work that you know, you do as a journalist, um, you mm -hmm. that you do in your uh, coaching practice, I, you know, how do you think leaders can and maybe have, whether it comes from your experience as a journalist or it comes from your experience in, in other places, how do you bring people together, you know, with varied 
cultural differences, work experiences, individual differences, even within Mm -hmm. culture. You know, it, it strikes me even thinking about journalism when you're out there as a journalist. You know, it's not even like the journalists who are around you are from the same culture. Like, it's people from all over the world covering, you know, different cultures. Yeah, but journalism is slightly different because you're given a huge amount of right. autonomy. Uh, and and the, the hierarchical layers are in journalism, journalists, journalism, or uh, pap- newspapers, radios, etc., are rather flat in terms of the layers. Right. You know, you don't have too many layers between you and... Uh, you might have a local, a regional editor, and then a foreign editor, and you know, a copy editor, and that's about it, right? Uh, so it's it's when large organizations, they're, they're gigantic, they're humongous, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's um, so th- as a leader, the answer to your question is number one. I think people have to be very clear and give each other time when they, they they're starting, for example, with a team to really get to know people. Uh, during COVID, it was very complicated, but, you know, be going in person to meet people is very important in their own context. Too often, organizations make a mistake of bringing everybody to headquarters. Yeah, okay, they get their dose, you know, their shoot of uh, headquarters culture, but the others miss a lot not going. So I know it's a matter of cost, etc. but that for a leader, I think it's very important. Second is really spending time and investing time in making sure that people build common common ground, commonalities, you know, what they're doing together, that roles and responsibilities, wh- and make sure that people understand, I mean, go beyond the assumption that people, uh, words mean the same for everybody. So it, going beyond this extra step is really important because, again, we assume, for example, trust, when we say trust, and people would use that as a mantra. Oh, yeah, we need to build trust. Oh, we have trust. Oh, you know. What do we put, what, tr- that, what does trust look like in your mind, right? Is it trust, is it because you deliver your work? Is it because you've been recommended by somebody I know, I respect? I mean, there are many, many ways of how you establish trust. I remember having a conversation with the CEO about trust. He was actually, you know, we had a conversation and we were talking about what, message he was going to deliver to his C-suite during a um, team building event. And he, he told the group that, you know, and I think this can be an American thing. We tend to expect other people to respect us and we expect people to earn our respect. And I think that shows up in lots of different cultures. I was recently doing some work with um, a a global, a global um, Mm -hmm. restaurant. Uh, group Mm -hmm. and they were dealing with the challenges of time space perspective you know like one of the awesome benefits of the way we're looking at globalization now is that you know for that company it gave them an opportunity to not just like physically be in the global places where they had business but to be able to hire who they perceive to be the best leaders regardless of where they lived in the world but they were yeah. certainly having struggles with trust that I think were rooted in that, that idea that trust looks very different in different cultures. Yeah. And that's a complicated piece. And it takes time. Uh, you know, you have to create a, a benevolent, a no danger space. You have to. Let, let, I tell you one story. I tell the story in, in my book on China because that's a good one. She was an American lady working in this. Uh, highly technical field of measurement, you know, whatever. Uh, And she had created, launched this uh, operation in China, Beijing, this very small group of a handful of people to 300 more people. Uh, Very smart, very smart uh, American lady was heading it. And what she did to build trust, she made on purpose on mistakes. And she acknowledged her mistakes, and she told me the story. And she acknowledged her mistakes in um, in front of the, the, the team, so that people would learn, would accept the fact that because they were in something very innovative, very creative, that creativity you have to make mistakes to learn. You know, you, you cannot get it right all the time. And she she did that on purpose, and it did help a great deal 
building the, the trust with her team. And eventually she groomed her successor, who was a Chinese gentleman. And that was remarkable. Uh, hey, are there other examples you can think of where leaders have handled those kinds of cross-cultural differences very well? Well, uh, yes. I just worked recently with the head of a supply chain for a big organization and, um, and his team. And I interviewed all the team members and wrote a report on this feedback on questions we had agreed I would ask. And the feedback was pretty ghastly, pretty, pretty, pretty negative. Well, he owned it and he turned to the team and, said, and, and acknowledged what they had said. And I can tell you that it completely changed the dynamic of they the were team. shocked by it. they were shocked by it. by the fact that he, by the fact that he said, "Okay, you told me this, that, and the other, and that's what I'm going to do about so it." Do you think, you like in it? thinking of those two stories, that a common thread to bridging some of these cultural differences, because we probably all walk into these situations with fear, yeah. is vulnerability? Yeah, absolutely. Vulnerability, humility, curiosity, uh, vulnerability. Uh, because if you walk into this, you know, into a, a meeting, let's say, and you know it all, well, you're not going to be attuned to the subtle differences, which might be crucial. And one other thing is, you know, it's particularly where you're, you're a native English speaker, you have to to be much more tolerant, make a special effort to make sure that people can, let, let me rephrase it, People might not handle English as well as you do. So you have, you know, that's really important for native English speakers to be sensitive to that. I, I remember the story of a German speaker, fluent German speaker that I worked with, and she was an idea factory, but she really had a hard time communicating them in English. Her English was very good, very strong, you know, virtually fluent English, but Part of what really made it work was when I would let her brainstorm. We came up with this idea mm -hmm. together. Brainstorm to me in German. I could barely understand what she was saying because the last time I took German was in middle school. But that brainstorming allowed her to get her ideas out and then communicate it in English. And I think mm -hmm. two things. That and my willingness to learn some German words made a huge mm -hmm. difference to her that I would have never anticipated. Yeah, and yeah, she yeah. had said to me once, like, she would sit in our meetings and feel like she was an imposter until we started doing that. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and I'm just thinking about it from the perspective, you know, you're sitting there as a subordinate sitting at the table with cross-cultural differences. You don't even know what gaps you have, and it can hide them. That's it. Yeah, that's the key, you see, Jason. I think it's very important what you're saying there. It's, it's the, the, the fact that you are oblivion. We are oblivious. You know, it's, we use often this image when we, in the intercultural world, you know, it's a, the fish. You, you're a fish in your, in your fishbowl. You know, it's when you take an out of your fishbowl that you're aware of the temperature, that you had water around uh -huh. you. Same with, with our culture. You know, it's by the fact that you're thrown into something different. Otherwise, why should you know? Right. Why, sh why should you be aware of it? So because companies, organizations, because the common commonality is doing business together, right? So on the basis of this, we assume that we do business together the, the same way the world around. Well, it, that, it's not true. Of course not. And we don't communicate about the same thing, the same way, with the, the same, depending on the people we communicate to, uh, the, you know, on and on and on. There's so many dimensions we could be, or entry points we could be looking at, you know, uh, some, some, uh, there are some cultural profiles, for example, some tools like this exist, which is okay, but it's, it's always a good start. But for me, it's the key piece, the first, first essential piece is your self-awareness. And it is, that applies to culture, that applies to anything else. You know, what is your leadership style outside of culture? Mm. You know, it's the self-awareness piece. If you have, if you are self-aware, well, you have probably more chances to be more attuned right, to others. Right, and you have to be willing to do that self-inquiry, which I yeah. think can be really hard for leaders because there's this, yep. certainly on the American side, this myth that you're supposed to yep. be, I don't want to say perfect, but strong, not demonstrate weakness. And it makes it really hard to do uh, self-inquiry. I've always thought that 
as a leader myself, one of the most important things for me to do is not just go out and own my mistakes, but like freely talk about mistakes that nobody would uh, ever find out about that I've made. I've never done the thing where I've deliberately made a mistake to do this because Edith, mm-hmm. I am a flawed man and I make many mistakes every day. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you too? <laughs> yes. Maybe it's just you and me. The, um, yeah. But one of the things I was kind of thinking about, thinking about this conversation is, you know, before this wave of recent globalization, you know, companies like British Petroleum or Chevron or ExxonMobil, DuPont, you know, IBM, certainly since the 1940s and beyond in Texaco, yeah. really operated globally. Um, but mm-hmm. what do you think the difference is between the way they used to operate globally and that way we operate globally, globally now? Well, I think there is more awareness that this cultural piece is an important and an important aspect, and the, the fact that you mentioned, you know, IBM or, or 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 oil companies. The first systematic research that was done in this intercultural field, where the concept of dimensions, what I what I call, you know, the one door you can open that can give you some information of what is different, uh, were was carried out first in uh, IBM, that was uh, Hofstetter. And then it was done at the Shell, or the, vice versa, I forgot in which order, by uh, Trompenas, I think, and um, I forgot, the, but some of the key uh, lead, uh, intellectuals or researchers of the intercultural field applied intercultural uh, theory to, to business were carried out in these large organizations. And actually, even earlier than that, Edward T. Hall, uh, who, you know, the silent language, etc. He was brought in by uh, the people in charge of the Marshall Fund uh, plan, oh, remember, yeah. with all these good intentions of rebuilding Europe. And despite all these good intentions and all the money put on the table, well, that didn't go that well. You know, there were tensions, there were complications. And he went in and looked at, at this piece, Edward T. Hall, and he, he was brought in to, to research that, to, to analyze what was going wrong. You know, so despite all good intentions, it it can be always a tricky piece. So the answer to your question is, what is different now? I think we have a better level of awareness. We have probably more um, diversity in terms of the leadership, the structure, etc. The communication is much easier yeah. because you know because we we can be people. People are on Slack or you know on permanent channels of communication with each other all over the world. All the time, if you want to. Yeah, right? we don't need a telex or, <laughs> or exactly, or, you know, uh, uh, or dictating your stories, right. you know, over the phone with a very bad fo- phone line, on and on. So, no, there is, at the same time, however fantastic uh, digital tools are today, and particularly for communication, it does not replace. It's still difficult, you know. The the, the something is to be said about you know being able to shake somebody's hand. Right, right. Yeah, uh, to be in their presence. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, I that struck me about returning to the office for our own company. I, yeah. you know, there. I really thought at the beginning of the pandemic, or a couple months in, we're never going back to the office. And when we be- went back to the office, and people talk about you know innovation being better and other things like that. And for me, the thing that struck me the most is I saw you no longer in two dimensions. I didn't see your yeah. face in a box. I saw the way that your leg moved, the way you crushed your arms. Mm-hmm. Your your nonverbal communication told me yeah. way more than the words um, that you're saying. And I felt like I could be a better teammate to people and a better leader. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and we we're hybrid now, but those three days that we're in the office are really m- meaningful to knowing where uh, where people are. Totally. Uh- Totally, because what I saw, you know, with many of the teams I've been working with who are spread all over the world, it, some of them don't even didn't even bother turn on their videos, right? So it ends up being purely transactional, purely transactional. There is nothing else, right? And that doesn't work. You cannot be just transactional. Yeah, it kind of, it, it's wild to me. People have been saying there was some data that came out, I think this week, about how productivity has gone down when people have returned mm-hmm. to the office. And I read through the whole article yeah. and I was like, there's one striking error in this article. You never define productivity to me. Because yeah. the, 
Yeah, yeah the agree. deepest productivity yeah, yeah. comes from a lot of um, informal spaces that are pretty difficult mm-hmm. to measure. Now, so I'm going to ask. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I'm going to ask you about a specific mm-hmm. organization. Um, mm-hmm. You had mentioned something earlier that kind of struck me about the Marshall Plan, and you know, one of the things about globalization when Thomas Friedman wrote about it and the world was flat, mm-hmm. talked about this idea that you know globalization could eliminate as much conflict and war between nations because we'd all be interconnected. At the same time, I'm a big fan of the British historian, Niall Ferguson, and he wrote a very similar book a little bit after that. And he said, hey, look, most wars are over natural resources. And at the end of the day, nothing about globalization is going to change that factor. But I think about a workplace like, and often people don't think about it as a workplace like the UN you know, since the League of Nations, we've been saying that, you know, people think globalization is new, but certainly since World War One and World War Two, we've thought the more we at the League of Nations and eventually the UN, as we become interconnected, not only are we going to be able to reduce wars, we're going to be able to address issues like climate change, we're going to make the world a better place. But some of that promise, you know, what can an organization like that like the UN or nonprofits or other groups that are interdimensional, what can they do to maximize the benefits of those intercultural connections? I would look at this from a different perspective. I think the UN or NGOs, you know, etc. at the moment, are a creation of the logic of the world in which we lived. It's an inheritance from the end of the uh. World War II, the, the UN. And uh, NGOs are, you know, essentially came out. It's a, it's a new version of a wealthy countries charity, if you ask me. Uh, the charity was practiced in the 19th century, yeah. right? We, but applied at a global level, and it can it and it is perhaps necessary I'm, that I'm don't, I'm not sure we 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 have either the time or the resources to to really debate this, but I think it is an important. Asking ourselves, what does it tell us about us? Mm. What, how did it was developed? How does this, did this system come into place? And what have we done with it? And we can see that it's reaching its limits. Um, you know, it's not because you have the UN that you prevent wars. Uh, there are lots of discussions about the necessity to reform the Security Council, for right. example. And that it's completely unfair uh, that this series of countries should be sitting in the Security Council and others should And that almost the Security oh, no, Council I mean, replicates the thing we were talking about before about, you know, the companies yeah. sending over their own leader from the other yeah. country. Yeah, we're globally diverse, but we're still running it. Exactly. So that's that's part of it. And, and, I, th- and, and I think the same for companies, you know, large organizations. Their logic was it's whatever the corporate social sec- responsibility little layer of varnish uh, or green touch that's put on it. These companies are, are there to to make profits and to you know it's very simple and it's not good or bad. It just is. So we, we've been talking a lot. You know, I, I took this course with Otto Sharma about uh, these companies that are more uh, more virtuous. Let's yes, put it like yeah. that. And everybody talks about Patagonia, but once you've given the name of Patagonia, you have to to look around and not that many at the large level. I mean, you have lots of interesting smaller right. companies. Number but maybe two. they cannot exist. <laughs> right. But maybe they cannot exist at, at this huge level at which these multinationals exist. And the very fact that they are multinationals uh, brings in itself lots of questions. So, we build this model. We know its limitation, and uh, yeah, we you know, and it is interesting that younger generations in uh, in the business world are perhaps more sensitive to this type of issues than mm. my generation, right, for example. Right, right, right. The the diversity that comes from it, the the an assortment of different things along those lines that can be super powerful. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, There's this 2001 study I read about in the Harvard uh, Business Review. It was was a survey of 90 countries and Mm. uh, people from 90 countries, and they found that 80% of white-collar workers in those countries at least occasionally completed projects on global virtual teams. 
I want to ask you, mm -hmm. what are some of the benefits of global, culturally diverse teams? Well, on paper, and this study proves it, you know, that's certainly true. When they work, we know, because quite a lot have, has been done, because so many of these teams are, are companies operate on these models. When they work, virtual global teams, they're fantastic because of the diversity and diversity generates cr creativity and, you know, much more agile in terms of transformation potentially, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, when they don't work, they really don't right, work. Right, right, right. That you're getting the opposite <laughs> sides of the spectrum. Yeah. If you do it right, you're going to get great value. Yeah. If you do it wrong, you're going to get less maybe than you, than you do. Exactly. So it's, it depends, you know, on, on which sector really... Uh, but uh, but no, it is potentially interesting. And I think at to a certain level, it's a matter of scale. You know, these large organizations have developed into these gigantic structures where people end up spending lots of time in reporting about what they do so that the organization doesn't lose track of what's going on in various of its tentacles, right? So it, it is... We're creating a little bit of the monster, and at the same time, it's necessary mm -hmm. if you want to have a global reach. So it's 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 a bit of a catch twenty two situation there, you know. Uh, and I I feel really sorry at times for some of the people I work with because they have very contradictory demands. You know, on the one hand, uh, they are asked to be extremely agile; it is you know the fashionable word. On the other, they 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 have to be you know how can I put it, you know, to be very reliable in terms of their reporting and uh, and they have to be extremely productive and on and on. It's really tough. One of the things I, I was thinking about, just sort of thinking of your biography and the work that you've done, mm. you know, you start out as a journalist, um, become mm. a coach and a facilitator. And then one of your strong interests becomes artificial intelligence. And I was just curious, mm -hmm. is there a link between those three things? I think so. I think it has to do with the place uh, where we put human beings, how humanity, uh, thinking about it. And, you know, when I was a reporter, what interested me were the humans I was interacting with, their human stories, you know, how big events were affecting humble individuals, right? Humble being just, you know, they can be the president or it can be the street sweeper, but still they're just human beings. Uh, so that was an aspect. Now, what I'm doing now is, you know, working with humans, with individuals, ha helping them achieve whatever they want to achieve. But it's with their, them as, as humans I'm working with. It's not, it can be the organization they produce, the teams they lead. It can be all this. But it's with, with their, 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 all their rich, their wealth and their fragility and their, you know, their contradictions. That's what I'm working with. And what I suppose uh, fascinated me in diving into this world of digital and particularly AI, but, you know, it's machine learning and it's the chatbots, it's a chat GPT thing, it's all these things, is that uh, large, there is a temptation in the coaching world to outsource some of the work we do to machines. Mm. One of the things that I've noticed as a trend in the coaching profession, too, two things that I personally find alarming. One is this outsourcing, companies like BetterUp, where you're outsourcing mm -hmm. to coaches through an application overseas, you know, sometimes not trained, but an increasing push among, you know, some assessment companies and now some companies in the coaching space to use AI. And I, I've been playing around with chat GPT and, mm -hmm. you know, I, if I ask it, a, you know, certain questions, questions about, um, I don't know, let's say sexual orientation, or I ask it a question about the African-American experience, it might give me a really excellent, cogent um, summary. But I recently got into an argument with ChatGPT. I can't really say it's a thing, an it, a he or she, whatever it is. But I got into an argument, do you have a personality, was my question. And do you have values? And it would not concede to me that it had a personality and values. But I said, well, why won't you answer certain questions? Why won't you address certain things? That's got to be based on some kind of value. 
And, Mm -hmm. you know, in artificial intelligence, whatever benefits it has, it's based on its programmers or its trainers' values Mm -hmm. and what they find valuable. But I'm really, really, on one hand, I am concerned because the thought of, you know, and another thing about chat GPT, I, I was like, you are not really going to be able to be a good coach until you can ask a question as far as just giving me advice. <laughs> um, but it concerns me that companies for expediency or cost or other reasons are going to attempt to replace, use artificial intelligence too far in team development and individual development. Is that at all a concern for you? Yeah, well, there are several concerns. I think it's, uh, there. there is a, the people who are behind uh, large groups like Better Up and in Europe, School Coach Hub, you know, etc. There's lots of money being invested because it's a, it's it's a market. It's a very um, very yeah. It's it's a good market because it's the market of well being and personal development, and this is very trendy, right? So there's money to be made. One second, we happen to have this technology. Uh, that can be used. What I find, there are several aspects. There is an economical logic to it, which is going, the massification of coaching. Sort of democratizing it. Which they call democratizing, which is a a marketing (laughs) way of putting it. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's uh, what I call the uberization or the merchandising of coaching. It becomes a a commodity. It's a commodity. It's right. a commodity. Coaching becomes well, a commodity. Why not? Coaching okay. rates have gone exactly. down. Training carrier exactly. Exactly. But generation. perhaps yeah. But perhaps more for me, and that is the hard reality of uh, you know there is demand and offer, and you know, and uh, when there is lots of uh, offer, well, the prices go down. Uh, and that has a real impact, though, because if you as a coach have to see double the clients to make a living because the rates go down, it ends up being the quality of work becomes lower. And if you're working with leaders, then the quality of their impact becomes lower. Exactly. But there are several aspects. You know, there is, um, that's the aspect with the, the, the coaching platforms, right? So how do they, how the coaches selected I really looked into that, and we even wrote, you know, guidelines, uh, best practices uh, for companies to look at on, in terms of how, you know, what they should be. Yeah, basically guidelines on on uh, what to do and not to do. But uh, also, what is happening more and more because you have it in apps, you know, for sports, for example. But same is happening mm-hmm. with coaching, all this personal development stuff, which is uh, like ChatGPT or another coach bot. Uh, will will uh, you will get engage in a conversation with a machine, and for me, it's um, it's taking out the human dimension because you know the coaching is a partnership between two human, two individuals, and second, it's giving sole responsibility to the person who's uh, to the to the coachee, and that's individualizing. Uh, this uh, all this effort and it's because I think forgetting part of what they may be missing is that as a coach I bring my own personality and values to the table mm-hmm. and the melding of that with the other person is where I find we really make great insights. No, I agree, and 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 also I would add one uh, another element uh, to food for thought. You know is the fact that by making each individual engage individuals in this conversation with a machine, not only you, get, you evacuate the, the human interaction, but you make this individual only sole responsible for its, uh, this conversation, for this, his development of uh, development, and you evacuate all the collective responsibility, mm. uh, the, what re- puts us together, what a company uh does for its people on and on you know what we discover in group coaching right. for example so it's I, I find that very i find that a very slippery slope and i find that i mean we, we are playing with it at the moment uh but it depends very much what we want coaching to right. be if we want coaching to be yeah a commodity 
well, then it's going to be this cheap commodity. Right, yeah. right. It'll be the McDonald's of... <laughs> As exactly. Point, right. Exactly. And, and and I think there's something to be said, right? Like coaching shouldn't be the Cirque and only the most rich people on the planet should access it. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. you know, one of my, you know, in, in many ways, I'm a fan of the International uh, Coach Federation, but the yeah. lowering of the bar, you know, and I'm not a big fan of ridiculous barriers to entry has really created a situation because as a consumer, you can't really easily tell Mm -hmm. the difference between a great coach and a bad coach. It's really um, created challenges. You know, I recently walked into an organization that had had a very low rate um, coaching Mm -hmm. contract. uh, Mm -hmm. And then we had been brought in because a new program manager had realized like we need to do better coaching. But there's absolute resistance mm-hmm. to coaching because of the bad experiences. Like, I think we can yeah. do good. We can do as much damage yeah. as, as, as good. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, but we are at, it's, it's an interesting moment. And some important decisions, you know, are going to be made. And, and many young coaches are, are going to find it very difficult. Uh, certainly. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, and I wanted to bring it back because I think that the AI piece of it, the intercultural piece of it, kind of there's a thread mm-hmm. I'm kind of feeling between them. And you know, I, I, recently I'm part of this research pilot project right now on what makes teams effective, team effectiveness. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things that's really easy to measure, and you and I know this from some of the work that we've done together, is team mm-hmm. cohesion. You know, and we often get brought in to do, you know, work facilitations, group coaching on cohesion or conflict management. And then two years later, I'm back with the same group (laughs) doing the exact same thing. And, you know, this research is leaning toward the idea that team effectiveness is really about a handful of things. And, you know, it starts with trust. Then it becomes norms Mm -hmm. like interpersonal, operational, compositional, Mm -hmm. and then results focus you know, really strategic adaptability and mission alignment. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we're sort of picking up is you can't pick up any of the other things if you don't have trust. And just sort of thinking yeah. about that cultural component, is there is there advice you would have for mm-hmm. leaders mm-hmm. about building well, trust? Well, as I, yeah, yeah, well, we've done it, you know, in some, uh, in lots of the work actually I've done with uh, with your, your, your structure, you know, it's a, uh, Having people voice, say out loud, what are trust builders and trust breakers Mm. for them? Just that that already. This way it gives you the kind of the the boundaries, you know, the danger zones, you know, the kind of must not do or should do, you know. I think that's, and this is transparent. It is no danger. You know, you don't point the finger at anybody. Just people say, well, for me, this is a trust breaker. Well, for me, this is a trust builder. It's very, right? that's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about me and some of my colleagues, and we've had conversations about this, not not formally, but, you know, and I, when I worked in, you know, clinical psychology, I would often say to the young mm. clients that I worked with, you know, you're going to lie to me at some point, right? I'm going to ask some question. You're not going to be ready to tell the answer. Always feel free to come back and, and tell me that, the thing I told yeah. you last week wasn't true. And I thought that was really important for um, teenagers and, and young people, but really, really everyone. But uh, the insight I took from that yeah. is lying is not the issue that's going to break trust for me. It just opens my mm-hmm. curiosity because I start thinking, well, mm-hmm. like, why are you lying? I have another colleague where, like, that's his bottom line. Like, if you, so, you know, my trust issues center around competence, I think. And I think his mm-hmm. trust around truthfulness that he's getting truth from you, it, make, it makes me think that some of this is, to your point about figuring out what those trust builders and breakers are, that some element of this is really about the individual as much as yeah. the collective and understanding self-awareness internally, but also awareness about the people around you. Exactly. And that's, that's, per, that's exactly the, the, my line of thinking as well. It's, you know, when we coach, we are working with our clients to develop their reflexivity, how they self-reflect, right? Uh, they, they, the, the space they create to 
reconcile intentions and actions, if you wish, right. right? Which is for me the basic equation of coaching. The same should apply to teams. And I regularly do that. You know, it's very well to have started by defining our values, defining our pr- purpose, you know, da, 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 all this stuff, and having talked about the trust breakers and the trust builders. But if you do not, in the course of your regular meetings, the day-to-day stuff, give some time to check with each other. Are we on course in terms of our commitment, how we treat each other, how we communicate with each other, how, where there are trust builders, where there are trust breakers here, etc. You know, just checking on, on all this regularly mm. is going to make a huge difference. Uh, and and some people have to, you know, it's it's very easy when, I mean, you know, the, the, these, the, the way these people, most of our clients work, they... They go from one meeting to another. You know, it's kind of nonstop. It's a, it's a, it's it's a spinning wheel. And uh, but having the capacity as a leader to to stop the machine for a moment and and give five minutes, and say, let's step back. How we how we feel today? How did we do with each other? How was it for you? For you? For yeah. Because you know? I I think about that idea that I may have a certain intent and then I have an action to carry out that intent. But it doesn't always have the impact and that often we stop yeah. at our intent. We're like, that's what my mm-hmm. intent was. But asking yeah. and pulsing. Well, exactly. thank you, Edith. This is an awesome conversation. I just want to check to see if you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to share. Well, I think the, the, the last part, what we just discussed, for me, it's the, it's the most important. It's both self-awareness and self-reflection. Right, and that applies to individuals, and applies to 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 groups. So, and I think if we if we encourage, you know, the work we do, in the work we do, in the way we are in society, we we can make um, have an impact. Well, thanks again, Edith. I really appreciate you coming on. I think this will be a really insightful and interesting conversation, and I'm looking forward to at some point having you back on. I really appreciate just in general the idea of being able to look at cultures and people through different lenses. And I think you've given us a lot of insights about that. So just wanted to thank you for all of that. And and hopefully we'll see each other soon in person. Absolutely. Thank you very much for, for hosting me and uh, for this lovely conversation. 